Hello. Hey, everyone. I invite you to take a seat as we get going for our afternoon session. Hope you had a delicious lunch and got to spend some time outside. The fire hose is about to continue spraying all of us. And uh, just before I introduce our next speaker, wanted to, um, what's going to happen is we'll have, uh, Dell will speak and then Jason will speak and then we'll have all of the breakout presenters come up here. So there, there'll be back-to-back -back breakout sessions. And uh, I'll ask all eight people to come up and talk to us about where their session is, uh, what it is, and um, sort of uh, what, why you should go. And so that will happen at the end of this, then there'll be a little break, and then these two back-to-back -back sessions. Um, I, just a reminder that if you do feel completely oversaturated, we are recording everything, and hopefully it will all be available in the coming weeks. So if you feel like you missed something, that is uh, uh, the case. The other thing to mention as I, I spoke with Jacob Smith, and those who are sticking around for Sunday, uh, there, there was a misprint on the schedule, and the 11 a.m. service where... Aaron Zimmerman will be presiding and Jacob will be preaching will be happening here. That's correct, right, Jacob? Here in St. George's, not in Calvary. I know there's, it's a little confusing because it's two buildings, but it will be happening here. Okay, um, this next speaker, uh, Dale Campbell, is here with us from Gary, Indiana, uh, which if those of you who know me know that that's a very place very close to my heart because of certain... Um, King of Pop, who was born there. Uh, be that as it may, uh, I heard Dell speak at a 1517 conference in California, and I was just pinned to the wall and uh, could not believe the power of this, this man, and I thought to myself, we've got to have him at Mockingbird. And so um, he serves at a Lutheran church in Gary called St. John's Lutheran Church. He and his wife, Lenita, are here. Um, and they've uh, had a really delicious breakfast, I believe, but he can tell you more about that. I think Dell's had about 15 different careers, and now he is a pastor. Um, and without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dell Campbell. Good afternoon, everybody. At, is this St. George? Yes? Yes? yes. St. George Episcopal Church, or home away from home until Jesus comes while you're here in New York City. Amen. Amen. Praise God, in whom all blessings flow. Now, as he told you, I'm a Lutheran pastor. Yes, I really am. <laughs> I wasn't always a Lutheran pastor, though. I didn't grow up Lutheran. So there's a lot of things I had to learn real quick. One of them I didn't learn really good was how to speak in measured dulcet tones. Like this. But if you all will pray with me, we won't be here long. And because there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff here in New York. We know this now because we got lost. We drove from the airport and they told me, don't get a car. You won't want to get a car. And I didn't listen. See, that's what happens when you don't listen to people. When you don't listen to a good word, then you end up, you know, like we were yesterday. We were so mad at New York. <laughs> we were so mad. We said, you know what? If they don't never hear a word from me, it'll be too soon. But I said, well, we're out here now. We're stuck. We may as well go here. And then we got up this morning. I said, well, I know it's close, so we can just walk. We'll leave the car. And so we did, and we walked. We had a nice breakfast, and then we got lost, and I found out something else. New York people are really nice. Yeah. Really nice people. So all them people that said otherwise is going to hell for breaking the Eighth Commandment. But let me, let me get to this, to this message, because there's a guy coming after me, and I don't want to bleed into his time, and I've only got so much, because I want to talk to you about two cities. Two cities, and no, it's not New York and Gary, Indiana. But let me, let me start with this. Uh, like I said, I'm a Lutheran pastor, so somewhere in here I've got to refer to the book of Concord. Today it's the formula of Concord, Article 11, concerning eternal predestination and the election of God. Now, in my days before being a Lutheran, when I was a Church of God in Christ person, I used to listen to Donald Gray Barnhouse. I used to sneak down into my car, 
you know, early in the morning, listen to Donald Gray Barnhouse, and, and he was so cool with that Scottish accent, and that was the first time I'd ever heard anything about predestination and stuff, because Kojic folk don't know nothing about that. All they know is, you better live right, and you let it stay holy, because the first time you say a cuss word, that's when the bus is going to come around the corner and knock you down, and instead of going to heaven, you're going to find yourself in hell, because you cussed at somebody on your way to heaven, shouting victory. Anyway, <laughs> that many are called and few chosen does not mean that God does not want to save everybody. Now, that's a revelation all by itself. But let me continue. Instead, the reason for condemnation lies in their not hearing God's word at all or arrogantly despising it, plugging their ears and their hearts, and thus blocking the Holy Spirit's ordinary path so that he cannot carry out his work in them. Or, if they have given it a hearing, they cast it to the wind and pay no attention to it, kind of like teenagers. <laughs> but then the fault lies not with God and his election, but with their own wickedness. Now bow your heads with me for a minute. Like I said, if you pray with me, I'll be too quick. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart. That by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All righty. I believe this, because God's word says so, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So I'm going to give you God's word with a little bit of my stuff interspersed in it, you know, for, for seasoning. Is that all right? All righty. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through 35. Don't worry if you don't have your Bibles with you and you, and you don't have one of them smarty phones. Just listen and faith comes by hearing, not by reading, so you'll be fine. <laughs> Stop now. <laughs> okay. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening, because you thought it looked like you, O king. Mm. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. All right, let that one percolate in your spirits a minute while I hit you with one from the New Testament. Revelations 11:15 says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, if you love the Lord, say amen to that one. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Now, these are two cities that are glaringly identified in Scripture in terms of the rule of God. Jerusalem, Babylon. Both cities are, or were, real physical places where people lived, worked, raised families, had social and economic pursuits, sinned, and died. The former was identified as the focus of God's purpose. The latter, the focus of man's purpose. The f the, now, they each had our spiritual centers of two governments. The former clearly identifies itself for what it is, while the other pretends to be what it is not. Chronologically, the two have existed simultaneously since the fall. 
growing and developing. Eschatologically, one will replace the other. The inevitability of this is certainly known to God, and I suspect, though he will never admit it to those over whom he seeks to rule, to Satan. It is thought by the world that love and hate exist in opposition, but I suggest to you today that this is no more true than it is true that the head and the tail of a coin exist in opposition to each other. I think that in reality, there is only love and hate, each directed in opposite directions as the coin is either properly or improperly oriented. But they're all on the same coin. For those of you that need a little bit of a word picture here, imagine if you love the Yankees, unless you're one of these newfangled folk that just likes to like everything, you hate the Mets. If you say you love them both, you're lying to yourself and to God, and you know better. I know this because I live in the Chicagoland area. I'm a Cub fan. I've rooted for the Cubs since 1968. And there's no way on God's green earth that I would ever put on a black ball cap and say those are the good guys. Those are the white socks. They are anything but the good guys because I'm a Cubs fan. But I love the Cubs. And to the same proportion I love the Cubs, well, the only thing left for the white socks is the other. Psalm 62, verses 11 and 12 says, Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. Now, when I was in Church of God in Christ, I knew what that verse meant. Oh, yes, I did. I knew that that meant, one, the only way I was going to get that Holy Ghost power, I had to get it from God. And two, that after I got it, I better work real hard because he was waiting, watching in the wings, taking note of everything I did. And it wasn't going to be a large margin, and no, he does not grade on a curve. Let me go a little farther, though. See, if, if all of this stuff was just stuff I thought up one day, then, you know, but it's not just me. St. Augustine outlived me by a few hundred years. He talked about two cities. Now, I'm just going to give you a little taste of it, chapter 28. Accordingly, two cities have been formed by two loves, the earthly by the love of self, even to the contempt of God. And if you think he didn't know what he was talking about, all you got to do is look around you on any given day, on any TV screen. You don't even have to spend the money to go to the movies anymore because you can watch it on Netflix. But the reality is, the earthly, it's focused on love, but it's the love of me. Everything else exists around me, for me, to do to me what I want it to do, or else it is of no value to me. Me is the ultimate sense of what reality is. In other words, for some reason, we live in a time when babies don't grow up, they just get bigger. The other city, it exists by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. The former, in a word, glories in itself, the latter in the Lord. And so when Jesus said, he who would be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The person that's part of the heavenly city hears those words and say, praise God from whom all blessings flow, I get to deny myself. Because myself is what got me into the situation where I needed a savior. And myself, now awakened by the spirit of God, not only knows that it needs a savior, it loves a savior. While the other one, the earthly, that loves self so much, it hears those same words and said, I'm not going to deny nothing to myself. Forget your cross. Why should I follow you? Because the ways I want to go, you don't even seem to know those ways. You don't party with me, Jesus. You might party, but you don't party with me. And I knew this when I was in the world. Jesus didn't show up at Nam Club I went to. 
When I was jamming with Parliament Funkadelic, Jesus was not on the dance floor with me. Now, some folk might have been out there saying that they was with Jesus and they loved Jesus. They was out there partying with Parliament Funkadelic and shaking it. Oh, yeah, oh, no, gee, wasn't. <laughs> if Jesus was there with, me, with them, then they was having a serious conversation on Saturday night, getting ready for Sunday morning, because they had a whole bunch to run up to the altar for, to get, you know, get cleaned up for, because they was out there like it wasn't going to stop. The only difference between the two of us is I wasn't faking it. I wasn't lying. I wasn't thinking about him. He wasn't thinking about me. We was doing our, each doing our thing in our own place. He was there on Sunday, and I wasn't bothered stepping on his place. He wasn't stepping on my place. That's how I thought it, because my focus was on me. Now, Augustine goes a little further. For the one seeks glory from men, the greatest glory of the other is God, the witness of conscience. The one lifts up its head in its own glory, and the other says to its God, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. Now, he says some more good stuff, but, you know, I've only got 30 minutes, so you're going to have to read that one for yourself. But the thing is, the end of all of this thinking is certain. As fixed as spinning of the earth upon its axis every about every 24 hours, and it's as wrongly perceived as the path of the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. Y'all do know that the sun does not actually rise and... Yeah, okay. But it looks that way, doesn't it? From, from our perspective, that's what happens. Every morning, the sun gets up. Sometimes it's a little late. But it gets up. It makes its little trip. And then, you know, at the end of the day, it goes back down. That's how it looks from our perspective. It's only the fact that a revelation showed us the reality that when somebody took a picture and confirmed what some other people had you know, thought, based, they, they reasoned it out, they said, well, you know, that can't be right. Then one day, someone went outside of themselves and took a picture, you know, extra nos. They took a picture of the earth and they said, nope, the sun is not the one that's doing the moving. Got it. Well, in the same way, God declared it as clearly as he declared in the revelation of Jesus Christ to John that every move of Satan was anticipated and countered by God before the foundation of the world. Y'all like talking about the book of Revelation, don't you? Oh, you're going to like this talk then. Revelation 13, 5 through 10, And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months three and a half years or so, it opens its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war with the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. It's amazing. The people in the world inevitably I don't care if you're talking about the woman who just can't leave alone those bad guys to the guy who just can't lead them fast women alone to the businessman that just never seen a shady deal that he didn't want to get involved with to the politician that couldn't help but cut corners every time there was a corner to be cut to whatever person you want to fill in the blank. If there's a sin to be committed, every person in the place will find a way to break at least one of them. That is how Satan rolls, and that's how his people roll. And authority was given it. Every tribe, people, language, son, yep. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, if some of you out there are King James people, you might have noticed something I did there because the ESV says that before the foundation of the world applies to the names written. But if you happen to have been reading the King James Version or some others, it would say whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life who was slain before the foundation of the world. So there's two ways of viewing this. From one perspective, the people their names are written before the foundation of the world. From the other, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And either one, and I know enough Greek to say, all right, you could get away with either one. 
You'd be all right. You wouldn't be wrong. As a matter of fact, you know, for us Lutheran folks, not that we think Dr. Luther knows everything, but when he was dealing with it, he dealt with it from the perspective of it was the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. In fact, there's a story of a guy named Heinrich Schmiedensteed. That's his name. I'm not making this up. He was getting his licensing exam, you know, so he could be a Lutheran pastor. And they talked about in his licensing, one of the theses that he had to address, for solely by faith in Christ, once promised, now delivered, the whole world is justified. From the beginning of the world to the end. All righty. Against Thesis 20, it is written, from the foundations of the world, the Lamb was slain. Therefore, the patriarchs correctly believe in the proffered Christ. Dr. Luther said, Christ was not in reality slain from the foundation of the world, except in promise only. From this, it is evident that all are justified by faith, which lays hold of Christ. Now, that might seem like a subtle thing, but it's not. It's not subtle at all. It's not subtle because the man who was being examined, well, by the way, he passed his examination, he gets ordained, and he launched into a very stormy career with perhaps too much vigor, for he was polemic by nature. Born in Lunisburg, he matriculated at the University of Wittenberg on May 22, 1524. In 1532, he was made Magister Artium, and the following year, he joined the arts faculty, becoming the dean in 1540. Follow the dates here, because it gets real interesting. Upon receiving his doctor's degree, he was brought by Duke Heinrich of Mecklenburg to the University of Rostock to lecture in theology and to serve as pastor at St. Nikolai's Church. He opposed the Leipzig Interim in 1548 strongly, preached openly against Moritz of Saxony, and on the insistence of Moritz was deposed by Duke Heinrich. With a group of followers, he went to the University of Griesfeld, where he seemed to have lectured privately and conducted the first Lutheran doctoral examination there. Called to Demarchen, he made a frontal assault on the flagrant sins, openly practiced, and was forced to flee to Holstein. He died in Wismar in 1554. So what? That's what somebody's saying. Why are you giving me all these dates? Well, clearly this guy lived in perilous times. The whole, I mean, the, 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 the Reformation in Germany was back and forth, up and down. In fact, most of his preaching career Things were not going good for the evangelicals. The royalty, they were supporting the Pope, and at this point, they had actually gotten the upper hand. He dies in 1554. He died when it seemed his labor was in vain. He was viewed as working against what seemed inevitable. And as a footnote, perhaps, the Protestant princes had won legality for their Augsburg Confession through the religious peace of Augsburg of 1555. And it again became the norm for religious life in most of the areas that Charles had tried unsuccessfully to return to the old religion. By faith, that German preacher stayed the course. He preached the pure gospel when all around him it looked like he was having no impact whatsoever. He dies, he goes to his grave thinking he was a failure for Christ. And one year later, just goes to show you, we walk by faith, not by what? Oh, say it like you mean it. <laughs> Now today, I live and work in a city that exists under a similar tension. Not on religious grounds though, but in terms of what's called social justice. Living in a city that's over 90% black or African American, a place where Black Lives Matter seeks to find a place of relevance. I mean, after all, how can you decry the racist oppression of the man when the man is black like you? As one caller to my morning radio talk show on WLTH AM and 92.7 FM put it, we have been in control for over 50 years. How can we blame the man for what has happened on our watch? 
Now, in addition, I live in a city that has a large religious presence. And by presence, I don't mean religious pluralism, like Athens with its Areopagus. I mean Christendom, and largely Protestant, if by Protestant you mean Methobapticostalism, <laughs> or what we Lutherans would simply call enthusiasm and now. And no, we don't mean because, you know, they, da, 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 da. no. Now, we've won the battle of the Reformation in Gary in that the diocese of Gary is basically a diocese in name only. I think they have one, one congregation left in the city. So in that sense, we, yeah, we won the battle of the Reformation, but we're poorly represented in terms of confessional evangelical Christianity in both numbers and influence. The church where my mission is based, St. John's Lutheran Church, or Evangelical Lutheran Church, and the church that supports me, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, are respectively the oldest church in the area and the first Lutheran church that was planted to serve the growing black population in Gary following the second wave of the Great Migration beginning in the mid-40s. Now as such, in terms of influence, they should have a historic and significant impact in terms of religion and culture. Wouldn't you agree? After all, it's the oldest church. And the other one in a city that's 90% black, it was the first black Lutheran church, and it's right across the street from Gary Roosevelt. And if you know anybody from Gary, they will tell you that Gary Roosevelt is the only high school of any significance. And if you didn't go to Gary Roosevelt and you're black, you ain't nobody. That is partly true, because before, oh, 1965, the only place you could go to high school if you were black was Gary Roosevelt. So if you didn't go to Gary Roosevelt, clearly you didn't exist until at least 1963. Now, they exist actually on the periphery of thought and activities for most of Gary's 69,000 residents. My primary efforts the, during this past five-year period have been to try to change that situation by getting the pure gospel and confessional worldview into the public square in as many ways as are available to me. As a result, every morning, Monday through Friday, I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning to be at a radio station by 6 o'clock to do the news, weather, time, temperature, and traffic and sports, and then two hours talking to people on the phone. No, not about church-related questions per se. It's just a regular AM and FM station, if you will, a secular radio station where we talk about politics and we talk about the school corporation. You know, I'm amazed. In fact, after these two days so far that I've been here, I look at how big New York is and how small Gary is. And as big as New York is, the, the political leadership seems to know how to run a city. And as small as Gary is, they still haven't figured it out. I don't know. Anyway, we do have a school, Ascension Lutheran Christian School. It educates children from kindergarten to grade six, but it's located just outside of the boundaries of the Gary Community School Corporation. An accident that, the, that, that our Savior Lutheran Church did not take into account, I wish they had it because now, although pretty much our entire student population are students who live in the boundaries of Gary Community School Corporation, but since we're outside of it, we cannot access any of their logistical uh, resources. So every time one of our kids' parents have to move, we lose them. It is so hard keeping a school running when people are moving from neighborhood to neighborhood and as a result, they move too far away to keep going to school and we don't have a bus to take them. Nevertheless, we keep plugging on. And other than my two girls, Danny and Dinah, y'all in here? Hi. My two girls and two other kids those are the only baptized, confessional, evangelical children in that entire school population. All the rest of them, they are Lutheran from Monday through Friday, and by Sunday morning, they're back enthusiasts. 
and then next Wednesday I get them back in chapel and we have to go through the whole process again. However, the good news is by now they know how to recite the Apostles' Creed and they know how to say the Lord's Prayer and they have learned that it really is a prayer that they can pray it and God listens to it contrary to what that person tells them on Sunday. So we're getting somewhere and you know with a little work and if I get to live as long as Moses we might get them you know. <laughs> but beyond that while the local clergy seems to have a lot of political influence with one lady uh, her name is Burgess Peebles. She's a self-proclaimed prophet of the living God and Faith Outreach Liaison to our Mayor, Jerome Prince, and Executive Director of Guaranteed Income Validation Effort in Gary. Her and several other pastors who were involved in a recent uh, bond uh, referendum to fund the Gary Public Schools, they have seemingly a lot of influence and they get paid pretty nicely for that influence. But then, every morning, at some point during the day, I'm going to get a phone call from somebody who talks about those preachers. Oh, Pastor, we're not talking about you, though. Uh, you know, they all they do, they chase after money, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and they talk to all these people. In the, and I go, but 66% of you listen to them. I wasn't one of them, but I'm still having to pay more in my property taxes for the 66% of you that did. And these folk, most of them don't even live in Gary. Silly me, I thought, I'm serving in Gary, I'm going to buy a house in Gary. I found out afterward, none of them live in Gary. They were smart. I'm dumb. But at any rate, that is life in Gary. And so these guys have got a lot of influence. They're politically well connected, but that influence does not translate into significant growth for the gospel. And over 50% of the population has no church affiliation, which under most circumstances would have me wetting my lips, rubbing my hands together, and saying, boy, it's a wide open field, if it weren't for one little thing. Because to that 50% that's not in a church right now, it's not because they don't know anything about the church. Oh, they know a lot about the church. You do a random poll, they will be happy to tell you how the church is just another of the myriads of hustlers who exploit the pains of Gary's residents for their own political and socioeconomic gain. A guy wrote a book, his name is uh, Brogdon Lewis, it's called Hope on the Brink. And he explored the interplay between church and life in a, t in a black community like Gary, Indiana. He said, with her voice trembling and tears in her eyes, she asked me, if God can't do this one thing, what is it all for? Why am I doing this? Now, I'll never forget that conversation. She had a particular need in mind that she prayed and hoped God would meet. But for me, I knew this conversation represented so much more. This unmet need represented a crisis of faith because her church teaches that a believer can confess and stand in faith. Yeah. And that God would answer exactly the way she asked. And she had been waiting for years, but God had not answered yet. Beyond the persistence of her confession, and continued sacrificial service to that church, her tears and words betray deeper doubts and fears. And those doubts and fears centered on the reality of her situation that looks like it's not going to change, regardless of the sincerity of her faith. So she asked why. Why is she doing this if God can't grant her this one thing? And as a biblical and religious scholar, he writes, I wanted to say, that is a good question. Maybe we need to talk about your church's understanding of God. But in the moment, all I could do was gently brace her for the prospect that this desire may not be answered, but it doesn't mean that her faith is not in vain. I can't help but wonder if she will abandon religion altogether 
or leave the church if it fails to meet her deepest need? Or will she continue to go to church and worship with deep fears and insecurities about the efficacy of faith in God addressing the unique needs of blacks in America? It could be Gary, it could be East St. Louis, it could be any place. Because for these people, the existential crisis is not how can I be justified before a holy God. That's what it was for the reformers. But for them, for this generation, the crisis is how can God claim to love me when he seems to be indifferent to my pain? A pain that seems to point in our American market economy, in particular to the words of the preacher. Ecclesiastes 10 and 19, bread is made for laughter, wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Food, wine, and money would seem to be the answer to many of the plights of a community where medium income is about 19,000. But people with acumen or pull can land salaries of 95000 That's the salary, by the way, of our Calumet Township Assessor. The Calumet Township Assessor's office exists to meet the needs of poor people. Poor people who, who have a family member who died and can't fund the funeral. Poor people who just got put out of their home and don't have anyone they can stay with. Poor people who, whatever the need is, write it down. And she makes 95000 so popular is the notion that government is the best hope for economic progress that you're more likely to hear of people launching nonprofits than businesses, seeking grants than building a clientele. And in such an environment, preaching the gospel takes second place to engaging in social activity. One church leader admitted on the air in a phone call with unintentional irony that his church was doing a charitable event so that the community can see that we are doing something. I don't even remember what the event was. But the clear loss of any connection between the motivation for that action and the proclamation of the gospel pushed me either towards shock or sarcasm. As it was, I ended the call, knowing that my co-host did not see what I did in that call, even though she thought, I mean rather, she even thought that the church is more of a social institution than it was the visible manifestation of God's will for all to be saved. How many of you all understand that particular truth, that that's why the church exists? Yes, there are poor people that need to be fed and clothed and sheltered and all these things. And yes, there are issues of justice and issues of virtue and all these things that exist in the world. But how many of you all understand that above and beyond all of these sins that are in the world, the church exists not to be the bandage over sin or to be the aspirin that takes away the sting of sin, but it exists to be the peculiar manifestation that God wants everybody to be saved. So much so that the only place where the gospel gets preached in all of its purity is in the church. No, I'm not talking about that place where you get together on Sunday and Wednesday night. I'm talking about the people that gather together, the body of Christ that goes about, whether it is those who are exercising the office of the public ministry, people like me who wear them funny collars, or the people who on that day are sitting being fed and nourished and nurtured in that word so that they go out into the world and fulfill their vocations, being the masks of God in their homes, in their schools, on their jobs, in all the various vocations that you all have. Or as Dr. Luther wrote in his small catechism, the mutual conversation and consolation of brothers and sisters. That's how the gospel is spread. So much so that as I had to tell one of my parishioners the other day, sister, that man, a man called her up and asked her, he had just gotten some money. And he asked her, do I, have, do I need to pay tithes on this? It was a fairly large sum of money, at least for him. And he asked that question, and she was prepared to tell him, yes, and you can give it to St. John's. And I said, did you tell him that? She said, well, I was getting ready to, but I wanted to call you first. I said, I'm so glad you called me first. Don't you tell him that. Tell him. In fact, first of all, if someone asks you a question like that, ask them why. 
Write that down in your notebooks. If someone asks you a question that's outside of their wheelhouse on spiritual matters, on biblical matters, write this down. Ask them why. Because I guarantee you, for the person whose normal conversation is not about the church roles, it's not about the church budget, it's not about the ministry, if they're asking you a question about funding the ministry, they've got a reason. And you need to know that reason before you answer that question. It's sort of like another question that seems to be of no big deal when they ask it. You think you already know the answer. Is it wrong to have an abortion? And you might think you already know the answer to that. But before you answer that question, if it's a young lady, ask her why she wants to know. If it's a young man, ask him why he wants to know. Because he might be the young man who decided he couldn't wait and convinced his girlfriend that if she loved him, she couldn't wait. And she loved him, so she didn't wait. And she loved him some more. And so when he said, we don't need to worry about anything because I can't get that. And then so she listened to him. And then now she's discovered he lied. And so now he comes to you saying, is it wrong to get an abortion? So he can go back to tell her. So when a person asks you a question outside of that wheelhouse, you ask them why. But we exist so that people might hear the gospel, so that they can hear the gospel that brings faith into their heart, so that they too can be with you telling someone else the gospel, so that person can get faith in their heart, and so that God is glorified. And so to do what I do as a missionary pastor when success in ministry is measured either in terms of dollars, seats, or influence, I do it by being pushed back into the missio day, the mission of God, and the truth that, as Dr. Luther stated in his lectures on Galatians 15.35, if the doctrine of justification is lost, the whole of Christian doctrine is lost. And if those in the world who do not teach it are either Jews or Turks or Papists or sectarians. For between these two kinds of righteousness, the active righteousness of the law and the passive righteousness of Christ, there is no middle ground. Therefore, he who has strayed away from this Christian righteousness will necessarily lapse into the active righteousness. That is, when he has lost Christ, he must fall into a trust of his own works. So in order for that righteousness, the righteousness of Christ to be received, I must do one thing. That one thing. You know, you remember Mary, the sister of Martha, the one who Jesus commended for doing that one thing that was needful while Martha was concerned about the many things that were socially expected and approved? That one thing remains now, as it was for Luther, as it was for Paul in his letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be ready, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And as he wrote to the saints in Rome, Romans 10, 6 through 11, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven or who will descend into the abyss. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith that we proclaim. I intended to draw upon the text of Matthew 20, 1 through 16 for today, but time, your patience, and wisdom lead me right now, especially because it's after 2 o'clock. So I'm going to stop here. But I, I do want to tell you this. In addition to the lesson that many of who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first, there's another lesson. Maybe you missed it. But if you check in the footnote of your Dell Campbell study Bible, you'll find it written, let it suffice to say that our Lord is still looking for workers. And those who are standing in the place of his seeking are still available and willing. While those who have lost interest will drift away as it is written. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idly all day? And they said, well, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. 
John sees the Lord in the Revelation standing in the midst of seven lampstands, which stands for the seven churches in Asia Minor. And in like manner today, I see the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about a mystical thing. I'm talking about a fact. Christ is in our midst because he said, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I see the Lord standing in the midst of those congregations where the gospel of Christ is proclaimed in all of its purity where people are pointed not to their own works of righteousness, but to the promises of Christ. The Word of God, who is the author and finisher of your faith, my faith, our faith, purchased with his own blood. And he provides us with strength through the Holy Spirit to get back up again, to keep the faith, and to continue to serve as God's masks as we live out our various vocations while we await the world to come where righteousness dwells. And the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord and let all of God's people here say, Amen. Amen. And for my next trick, I'm going to ignore that drum set there, which is so calling my name. God bless you all. Right at it. <laughs> How are you all? Uh, Campbell made sure that I don't bump the mic here. Uh, I want to thank Dave Zoll for giving me the uh, post-lunch nap slot. Uh, thank you for that, Dave. Uh, I want to thank Jacob Smith for taking the uh, sticker off of my new jeans uh, a little bit ago. That was nice. Uh, and then the, the nice woman from Minnesota who, uh, before lunch, pointed out that I'd gone through most of the morning with my fly down. Um, <laughs> right now, I'm really grateful for you. Uh, so anyway, uh, most of you are Episcopalian, which means you're used to sermons that are like seven minutes long. Uh, I don't know how you can sit here and listen to people for this long, so uh, everybody stand up. Like, say hi to someone. Oh gosh, that was a mistake. All right, now sit down. You're so obedient. Stand up again? No, just kidding. Um, will you uh, pray with me? Heavenly Father, On account of your Son and through your Holy Spirit, help us to rest in your grace while remaining awake. And all of God's people say. Amen. When I was only a few months into my first pastorate, I made the mistake of actually telling the truth. I, I, I actually answered the question from a stranger, so what do you do for a living? I was sitting in an old-fashioned leather and steel barber chair with a bib around my neck and, and hot lather around my ears, and, and actually I'd been nicked, so I was bleeding too. What do you do for a living, the barber asked. I'm a pastor, I replied naively. Forty-five minutes later, Having told me all about the dead wife he was still grieving and the girlfriend she never found out about, the barber wiped his eyes and blew his nose for the final time and stood up from the other leather and steel chair to, to finish cutting my hair. I've shaved my head ever since. <laughs> I, you know, I, I know better now. Plane rides, waiting rooms, my wife's law firm parties. Like George Costanza, I answered that question. So what do you do 
I'm a marine biologist. <laughs> but on the train ride up from DC yesterday, thanks to Mockingbird, I didn't have to tell the lady who sat down next to me in the quiet car that I was an architect and, and risk that she somehow possessed more construction knowledge than Simeon Zoll. No. No thanks to Mockingbird, I could say, me? What do I do? Oh, I, I'm a writer. And that was that. She didn't say anything else. She didn't need to confess anything to me. She didn't want to, to convince me that we're all on the, the different paths to the same destination or, or how uh, nature is her church. She didn't bludgeon me with a litany of the church's many sins. She just nodded, and she didn't say another word. So thank you, Mockingbird. Thank you. Not only did you give me the gospel when I could not find it anyplace else, not only have you gifted me friends I did not know I needed until I received them, you have also provided me with a plausible, socially acceptable alter ego so that I can ride the Acela train without needing to dispense free marriage counseling or apologize for the Russian Orthodox patriarch. <laughs> because the truth is, the truth is, a quarter of the way into our third installment of the year 2020, I'm much too weary to do extra work. I'm weary of friends and family members and congregants following the science in opposite directions. I'm weary of, of worrying over, over, over where the, the most incidental of exchanges with a neighbor will, will infect them or, or incite them. I'm tired of doom scrolling. I'm tired of feeling the need I have to have an opinion on the, the goodness or badness of social media. I'm tired of tiptoeing around social and political and racial and, and sexual issues like I'm walking on eggshells in an alcoholic's home. I'm tired of institutions disappointing us. And I'm tired of leaders so consistently proving the doctrine of original sin. Yeah, but mostly as a pastor, and as a Christian, I'm exhausted from thinking that the future of the church is my responsibility. That it's on me to get the gospel right so that my hearers will get the gospel out. That it's on us to make the world a better place. That it's on us to make history come out right in the end. And as a pastor, too, I am tired of hiding my own family drama and problems from my church so we can just do the next thing. Like Bilbo Baggins, I feel like butter scraped over too much bread. I'm weary. In the midst of life, we have been in death these last two years. From where shall our help come? Whence comes hope for our wither. Oddly, I think we can find hope in a terrifying little story Jesus tells on his way to getting himself crucified. It's part of Jesus' temple tantrum. Jesus, you know the story. Jesus, without the benefit of a seminary education, is in the temple preaching. Eh, this place is supposed to be a, a house of prayer, but, but you've turned it into a den of robbers, he screams. And look, with all your tight sphinctered, keeping up appearances, piety, you've pushed all the people with actual biblical problems, the poor, the blind, and the lame, you've pushed them to the margins. And, and you money changers... You money changers, Jesus says. You call that a fair price for a goat? Pause for laughter. <laughs> exactly what part of the commandment, Jesus says, exactly what part of the commandment is unclear to you? I have seen fair prices for animals in airport food courts. Good Lord, toddlers with dirty diapers and, and babies at the breast, Jesus says, could do church better than a lot of you. And just to drive the point home, Jesus offers his listeners a, a sermon illustration. 
Jesus takes a, a, an ordinary, innocent fig tree that, so far as we know, never did anything wrong to Jesus. Jesus takes a, a fig tree, and Jesus gives it the stink eye, and he hollers with his outside voice, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree, the Gospels report, withers all at once. In response to his arboreal assault and battery, Jesus' listeners start in on his bona fides. Just where in the blank does he get off like that, they ask. Did anyone check his references? Who's actually seen his CV? What divinity school did you say he attended? We liked the last preacher we had a lot better than you. No, you didn't either, Jesus replies. Your last preacher was John the Baptist, and you all killed him and served him for dinner. It's not the messenger that's your problem, Jesus says. It's the message. And while they chew on that truth bomb, Jesus, proving he'd never passed the United Methodist Board of Ordained Ministry, Jesus doubles down on their offense, and he, he spins the rudest of all of his parables. Once upon a time, Jesus says, once upon a time, before he bought Twitter to save democracy, Elon Musk bought up some land in Napa because he fancied himself a, a venter one day after he'd cashed out his stock options and retired. When it came time for harvesting the grapes, the, the vineyard owner sent some interns up north with a message, and, and darn it, if the fruit pickers didn't beat one, kill another, and, and stone one more. The rich guy, though, he's an odd one, Jesus says, as the parents in the pews all cover their children's shocked and scared ears. The owner of the vineyard, Jesus says, doesn't react the way you might expect. He doesn't call the police. He doesn't cancel them on Twitter. He doesn't talk to Oprah about it. Instead, he, takes, he doesn't even take a, a helicopter up to Napa to take matters into his own hands. No, he, he, he hands over another message and sends another company car full of overachieving interns to the vineyard. But the fruit pickers do the same to them, too. They zip tie them to the grapevines, Jesus says, and, and beat the life out of them. Fool me once, fool me twice. Would you believe this fat cat didn't learn this lesson with these rotten, no-good workers? Seriously, he tells himself, if I give the message to my son, if I send my son up there, surely they'll listen to him. And as soon as they hear the kid's car coming up the gravel drive, the fruit pickers look to each other and say, this A-wall vineyard owner is never going to come around here. If we off his son, we can have this place to ourselves. So they take him across the property line and they kill him. Now, Jesus says to his listeners, what do you reckon this father will do when he learns they've murdered his son in a, a shameful fashion and, and left his body in the brush forsaken like trash? Messenger after messenger what do you guess this father will do after they've killed this ultimate message bearer? Surely he'll put those wretches to a miserable death. They answer so fast, not even one raised their hand. And that's when our Lord smacks his forehead. You mouth-breathing morons, Jesus responds. You pick apart your preachers, but you don't know your scripture. It's right there as plain as the ugly on your face. Psalm 118, the stone you all rejected has become the cornerstone of the masterpiece the Lord is building. In other words, in light of what God's determined to do, all our refusals and rejections are only provisional. I've made a decision for Christ. We say, no, God has made a decision for you in Jesus Christ. And sooner or later, by hook or by crook, God's going to pull it off. They warned me about him before my first Sunday at the church moving boxes into the parsonage, a, a lay leader stopped by with a housewarming gift. Watch out for old Les Norton, Steve said. His, his, his bite is worse than his bark. 
less, I repeated the name. Well, how bad is his bark? It's like one of those neighborhood dogs that makes you glad you don't keep a gun in the house, he said. You got a picture? How, how will I know him, I asked. Trust me, he'll introduce himself, Steve said. Les was short and bald and wiry, the kind of geezer you picture in a, in a tight white tank top with patches of hair on his shoulders and A1 stains on his tummy. In 14 years, I never learned whether he shouted because of his hearing loss or, or his general demeanor. My first Sunday at the church greeting people in the narthex after I delivered the message, Les refused my outstretched hand, and he crept up close to me, looking me over like a dermatologist. I got absolutely nothing out of your sermon, preacher. <laughs> it hurt a little, being my introductory Sunday and all. But like a good United Methodist pastor, I quickly pivoted into my best mode of non-defensive defensiveness. Bless your heart, I replied. He narrowed his eyes and he sucked at his teeth angrily. Look, I said, there's an unnecessary war going on in Iraq. Maybe the Holy Spirit had better things to do today than speak to you. <laughs> this isn't going to end well, he said storming off. My third Sunday at the church, after I brought the message, he came up to me as I was getting a cup of coffee. How much are we paying you? <laughs> Suddenly it seems like not nearly enough, I said. <laughs> Why do you ask? Because it's obvious you're not called to be a preacher. You're terrible at it. The only explanation is that you must be in it for the money. He'd wounded me. So I shot back at him. Well, sir, I may be terrible at it, but then again, it's, I've always thought the churches get the preachers they deserve. <laughs> this isn't going to end well for you, he whispered. But because he was deaf, all the eyes near the coffee station were fixed on us. One Sunday, I offered a message on Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And during the sermon, I spoke about racism as the refusal to recognize the justifying work of Jesus Christ. Monday morning, Les barged into my office, throwing open the door so hard it knocked my portrait of Karl Barth off the wall. <laughs> Just where do you get off getting political in the pulpit? You calling me a racist preacher? Me? No, I said. But isn't it interesting you heard the Lord calling you a racist? <laughs> I guess there's hope after all. We really do serve a living God, I said. <laughs> Idols stay conveniently quiet, but, but you can't control what a living God might say. This isn't going to, yeah, 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 I know, I said. This isn't going to end well for me. In 2010, the church offered hospitality to a neighborhood mosque undergoing renovations, welcoming them into our youth wing for their Friday prayers. It even got us featured on The Daily Show and interviewed by John Oliver. The Sunday before that first Friday, I delivered a message on Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. You can Google it. In it, I said, Scripture doesn't teach that after we welcome the stranger, the stranger will cease being strange to us, or that our differences will be insignificant. Scripture doesn't teach that by loving our enemies, our enemies will cease to be our enemies. Scripture doesn't teach that by visiting the prisoner, we'll convince the prisoner to swear off crime. Scripture doesn't teach that in feeding the hungry, the hungry will show appreciation to us, or that in caring for the needy, we won't find them a burden to us. Rather, in a world of violence and injustice and poverty and loneliness, Jesus has called us to be a people who welcome strangers and love enemies and bring good news to prisoners and feed and clothe the poor and care for those who have no one. Pretty standard sermon, I thought. But if Les had had rocks in the pews, he would have sidearmed a few of me. Instead, he got up literally in the middle of my sermon and he marched out, stopping at every other pew in an attempt to persuade others to follow him. 
And more than a few did, which stung me. And later that afternoon, Les Norton filled up the church voicemail, my voicemail, the senior pastor's voicemail, litigating the issue. And later that week, he passed around a, a petition in the congregation for the bishop to remove me. And when I saw the signatures on the list, yeah, that hurt me too. One Christmas, the message the Lord gave me was from Matthew's nativity, where Jesus is born a, a refugee in a Middle Eastern nation occupied by the military of a foreign empire. Sound familiar? I asked my listeners before I confessed, I'm not sure I like my part in the Christmas story. Les didn't like it either. Christmas is about family and cheer and tradition, he yelled over the brass quintet after the, the benediction. Family, cheer, and tradition, I said. That sounds nice. I like family, cheer, and tradition. I don't know why the Lord didn't say anything about any of those things, but I, I do like them. This isn't going to, yeah, 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 I said. Merry Christmas. One Mother's Day, I brought the message. It's always a bad idea for me to preach on pagan occasions like Mother's Day and the 4th of July. I'm an Enneagram 8. So that Mother's Day, I turned to the, what Jesus said on the subject. I, I preached on Luke 14. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, brothers and sisters cannot be my disciple. Jesus just isn't all that concerned about the family, I said. Of course, mothers and fathers love their kids. Their kids look just like them. That's narcissism. That's not discipleship. Jesus is after creating a different kind of family, bound not by blood, but by baptism, I said. I didn't expect anyone really to, to like the message, but I certainly did not expect Les Norton to challenge me to a fist fight in the fellowship hall. <laughs> Absolutely true story. You can ask my wife, you can text her now, 540-460-8583. With the whole coffee hour crowd staring at us like you do watching Sarah Condon break bad in an airport gift shop. <laughs> With everyone staring at us, Les poked me in the chest and challenged me to fight him. He then dropped to the floor and did a dozen push-ups. <laughs> to prove he was up to the task of making things end badly for me. Before one of my denomination's interminable and expensive arguments on sexuality, I brought up the, the topic in a message, a, a pretty vanilla sermon. Les later harangued me in a church council meeting, attacking me for being too grace-centric and hollering about how my sloppy agape would ruin his grandchildren. <laughs> one of these days, he pointed at me, smiling sarcastically, it's not going to end well. It wasn't until Les's funeral that I discovered that one of his sons had never come out of the closet to him. Now for that idea that Simeon says we shouldn't dwell too much on. In the ancient church, Roman persecution provoked a, an ecclesiastical debate over the efficacy of sacraments performed by preachers who had recanted their faith in the face of torture. Does the, the Eucharist, for example, depend upon the, the preacher's strength of faith or, or moral integrity in order for it to be a means of grace? With St. Augustine, the, the church answered in the negative with the Latin phrase ex opere operato, by the work worked. That is, the sacrament remains effective, an effective means of grace, because it is not the preacher at work in the sacramental work, it is the living word of God. It is the living word of God that is effective and creative, attaching itself to water and wine and bread and the unimpressive, inadequate words of, of a preacher. 
From his jail cell, the Apostle Paul admonishes Timothy that the only thing a preacher of the gospel has for which to be ashamed is in poorly handling the word of truth. That's it. Tell me in the narthex that the sermon didn't make you feel good or give you practical help for Monday. I won't take offense. Say I I stepped over the line with a joke or a story that didn't land. Okay, there's always another Sunday. Fire off an email and accuse me of being a liberal or or a conservative, and I get both every week. Go ahead, it's no sweat. I won't give it two seconds worry. I can take the hits. After all, Jesus says he's got a cross that'll fit my back just fine. Gripe until your fingers cramp up. I will sleep just fine. But tell me I haven't handed over the unfettered word of God. Tell me I haven't delivered the message and I should be ashamed of myself, Paul says. God is so unassuming in the world, Karl Barth says, but so revolutionary in relation to it. He means that the way the living God makes himself known in the world, brings something out of nothing, gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist is through ordinary words. The words of ordinary messengers. From this time forth, I make you hear things, declares the prophet Isaiah, new things, hidden things, which you have not known. Before today, you have never heard them. I don't know why our Lord keeps sending message after message after message to to hard-headed people like us. Nor do I know why he chooses ill-equipped people like me as his mode of communication. Now, that's not even offensive enough. I don't know why God chooses ill-equipped messengers like me as the primary way he is active and found in the world. But I do know that the word of God says that it is the will of God that all shall be saved. That's the epistle to Timothy, for all you want to argue. I do know the word of God says that it is the will of God that all shall be saved. Therefore, all our stubborn and short-sighted no's are bracketed by a much bigger yes, that God is hell-bent on speaking to us in Jesus Christ. That the word is a living word. That the word of God is unfettered and able to work not only in spite of me, but apart from me. That God is hell-bent on being gracious. That gives this weary messenger the hope to go on. Just a, another real-life mockingbird example, Camel. So I wrote a post for Mockingbird for Good Friday. The powers that be on Facebook tried to fetter God's word. Rejecting my Good Friday post for Mockingbird because of its, quote, shocking and sensational content. And yet, Camel, the next thing. Somehow my vacation video from the following week was not deemed too shocking or sensational. (laughs) Facebook tried to block the word of God, and yet, here we are, streaming this service. So Take that, Mark Zuckerberg. Back to Les. I'm not sure when it happened or what message it was that, exact, that, that, that finally broke through, but a couple of years before he died, Les Norton came up to me between services one Sunday morning. He'd been keeping an unusually low profile for a while. I gritted my teeth and steeled myself for another tongue lashing. Bless your heart, I was ready to say. He patted me on the shoulder and he said, 
Preacher, I don't know why it took me so long to hear, but now, some days, the only thing saving me from complete despair is whatever word the Lord's bringing through you. It's a testament to the depth of our sin that we make the, the wicked tenets the, the subject of Jesus' parable. You know, for, for that matter, as Robert Capon points out, we get so preoccupied with the supporting cast that, that we misname nearly all of Jesus' stories. The parable of the prodigal son. No, it's not about the, the rotten kid's brother. It, it's about the father who's already forgiven his children before either of them has done an ounce of repenting. The parable of the lost coin. No, it should be called the parable of the crazy lady who is willing to turn over her whole house for a single worthless nickel. The parable of the lost sheep. Nope. It's really a parable about a shepherd who refuses to abide by our expectations for good and responsible shepherding. We're so wrapped up in ourselves, we miss the main character. You know, in Jesus' parable, the, it, Jesus credits the vineyard owner with a whopping eight verbs. It's not the vineyard owner who's fooled again and again and again. It's every one of us who think this parable is about the wicked tenants. It's about the owner with a capital O. It's about the ridiculous patience of God and the gracious persistence of his word. Now, Jesus says to his listeners, what do you reckon the father will do when he learns they've killed and forsaken his son? Surely he'll put those wretches to a miserable death, they say. Wrong again. No sooner had we nailed his son to a tree than the Lord sends out another messenger. This Jesus that you crucified and killed, Peter preaches, God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it is impossible for him to be held in death's power. Repent and believe. Ours is a loquacious God. And he's not squeamish. There is no body count the Lord's not willing to rack up in order to be in conversation with you. Which, as grisly as it sounds, is good news. It's the good news that the good news is not your burden to bear alone. We really can rest in his grace because ultimately the gospel is his work, not ours. I held less just before he died. God, I'm so thirsty, he said, like Jesus on the cross. Life almost always ends in all too human a fashion. While Les lay in his bed, agitated and thirsty, his wife sat in a lazy boy in the adjoining room, the television blaring, watching the John Wayne movie Rio Bravo or, or Rio Lobo. I, I'm not sure which one. They're both the same movie, I think. Paul Zoll can explain the differences. He was in bed, dying. His wife is watching the John Wayne movie. And knowing that his time was drawing short, he was, he was scared about what came next. What do you think the Lord will do? He panicked. What do you think God will do with me? Haven't you listened to any of the messages I asked? You've been baptized. You're safe in his death. It's going to end well for all of us. Say it again, he said. Say it again. And though I did not want to, though I was exhausted and weary, I felt compelled. Friends, Christ is risen. Ours is a living God whose word can work what it says. For those like me who are dead tired, that's good news and a reason to hope. I offer to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
today, I'd like to invite all of the breakout presenters to come forward. We'll start with the first block and then do the second block, but you guys can all come forward at the same time. First block, I believe, is Tasha, Sam, Elizabeth, and Ben. The second is Amanda. Is James Wilson here? That so-and-so. Uh, Adam and... Um, Anyway, I should probably have a, the program. <laughs> so, Sam, why don't you go? Um, the great Tina Fey once said that everything that has ever happened will eventually be funny. And we're going to be exploring that idea. We're going to be talking about the um, humor uh, of hope. We're going to be uh, talking about humor in general, what makes something funny in the first place. And we're going to be watching some Saturday Night Live videos. I agree with those of you who think that that show can be hit or miss. We're going to be looking at the hits. Right here. That's right here. Um, hello. My name's Elizabeth Pastorella. I'm a writer and an author um, and a very nice person who is also going to talk about yelling, yelling and anger. Um, I don't know where Sarah Condon is, but thank you, Sarah, for saying that your parents were yellers. I feel like I'm in much better company now. Um, I'm going to tell a lot of embarrassing stories about my life and yelling at my husband in public, so it'll make you feel better about yourselves. You're, you're in Pierce house. And I, I'm in Pierce House, wherever that is. So clearly our son was not paying attention to us when he t we told him we were coming up here and he needed to stay put. Um, I'm Tasha Genk Morton. I'm going to be next door and I'm going to be talking about um, the question of could I be any more Asian? And the answer is most definitely. <laughs> I'm just going to verify again that you're going to let me say this. I'm Ben Madison. Uh, the title of my talk is Fucking Hope. And I'll be in the cave. Sorry, he's got headphones on. I feel like it's okay. Right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Look, my wife took our kid home. Like, we're okay. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, wallowing in despair and the great joy that that brings. And I'm going to say fuck a lot. So. Hello. Um, oh, there's a stool. Um, my name is Amanda McMillan, and I really love reality TV. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that and all the reality TV that I've watched in the last two years of a pandemic. Um, I'm going to be talking about Lutheran theology, believe it or not, some justification, some imputation, and some Real Housewives of New York. So I hope to see you at 4 o'clock here. My son is understanding instructions not to repeat what daddy says. So I'm just going to add Ben to the list and it'll be fine. <laughs> I'm Adam Morton. Uh, I'm going to be, where am I going to be? I'm going to be in the cave, thank you. Uh, I am going to be in the cave talking about, oh, political polarization, culture war, not deeply into that, but actually the deep theological waters under it which are two conflicting and at war visions of the law and how they are operative and ultimately the very good news that God is not the law. We also have two more at the four o'clock hour. One is by James Wilson. He will be in Pierce House talking about Rene Girard. Uh, church father for a secular age. If you've never heard James, he's it, it's sure to be very uh, deep well. And then finally, uh, Matthew Hoskinson will be speaking about hope when it comes to the church. One with Jesus, how an ancient promise inspires confidence about the future, and he'll be talking about that in the chapel. So right now, we'll have about a 10-minute break, and then we'll get going on those sessions. Uh, it said 2.45, it'll probably be closer to 3. Um, all right, everyone. Enjoy. Enjoy.